All right, thank you everyone for joining us today for our anti-harassment program and webinar for interns in the Latino Heritage Internship Program and in Mosaic's Internship Program. Um, Ken Brody is our presenter today. He works at the National Park Service uh, and he's the anti-harassment program manager. And I will let Ken take it on from here. All right, thank you very much. Good morning to some and good afternoon to others, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Ken Brody. I work for the National Park Service. I've been an employee of the National Park Service for the past 40 years. I started my career off actually as an intern and a volunteer with the National Park Service many, many years ago and, and loved it so much that they gave me a page job to continue to work and I've enjoyed working here. Um, a little bit about my career. I started off after you know first coming to the Park Service as a park ranger did all the things that park rangers did, did some time as a supervisor, did some administrative work as administrative officers, contracting officers, uh, didn't like that much, got back into the field, became um, a safety officer, from there went to become an investigator, uh, got involved in law enforcement and went to the United States Park Police, another law enforcement arm within the National Park Service as a deputy chief. And when I left the uh, 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 Park Police back in uh, 2013, I, I transferred to our headquarters operation. Uh, and now I, I'm responsible for our anti-harassment program, harassment prevention and response uh, program manager. This is important for everyone to understand about harassment, anti-harassment, the processes for reporting it, what it actually looks like and some things to avoid. Um, there are a lot of things that when people look at a harassment, uh, they see things in a different light. So understanding it, you know, whether or not it was intentional behavior, whether it was unintentional, based on speech, uh, also with the use of the internet. Um, and these platforms such as Zoom, we find that even remote workers have had difficulties uh, as it relates to harassing conduct or, or bullying kind of conduct as it may be. We wanna make sure that everyone knows their roles and responsibilities and that everyone is aware of how to report a situation if it may arise and that you understand what that particular process is. So one of our main major goals is to make sure the National Park Service takes immediate and appropriate corrective actions, including disciplinary actions to eliminate harassing conduct, um, regardless of whether it rises to the actual level of a violation of law. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that violation of law. You can have um, harassing behavior that doesn't rise to the level that was covered by the Equal Opportunity Commission, EEOC's Title VII. Um, but in the National Park Service, we look at all of that harassing behavior as it relates to protected activity or protected classes of individuals. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation, that our goal is to address harassing conduct at the earliest possible stage before it becomes severe or pervasive. And that's harassment within the meaning of the anti-discrimination law under the Equal Opportunity Employment uh, Commission's regulations. Our overall goal is to stop harassing conduct, whether it's from um, you're experiencing one of our employees, one of the National Park Service, or one of our volunteers uh, harassing you, or whether you are actually the person that's doing harassment to one of our employees, we take it very seriously and we work with our partners to make sure that everyone has a clear understanding of the roles and the responsibilities of our anti-harassment po policy and pro process and program. So before we get started, talk a little bit about the core values that the National Park Service have. One of those, of course, is being respect. We embrace each other's differences so that we may enrich the well-being of everyone. We still have problems. Um, I'm not going to paint the picture that the National Park Service doesn't have harassment. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have a job. Um, but we do have those issues, but we do respond right away to those issues. We have trained staff throughout each of our National Park Service regions. And we have folks uh, that uh, supervisors that are supposed to know how to do uh, the reporting and we do annual memorandums and trainings along that same line to address that and with an integrity we deal honestly and fairly with people in the public as well um, we have a tradition we're proud of it but we learn from it but we're not bound by it so we do address those particular things and try to be very transparent we also strive for excellence to continually learn and improve so that we may achieve the highest ideals of public service public service is a public trust uh, last week was Public Service Recognition Week, which happens in the month of May. Um, and we also have shared steward. We share a common commitment to resource stewardship with the global preservation community. In order to get that done, we have to value the very diversity and equitable, and equitable kinds of issues, including having access 
and making sure everyone understands that we will not tolerate um, disrespectful behavior, especially that behavior that amounts to um, misconduct of, of, of harassing nature. The parts of the, our harassment goal is to clearly define expectations in our processes, making sure that our employees, our interns, our non-federal employees and managers understand the duties and responsibilities. Managers also have a duty to act whenever um, harassment is brought to their attention. And that's one of the things why we talk about and do this particular training to make people aware of the particular process. Because if you see something, you don't say something, we're not aware of it, it can inherent, uh, inherently increase our liability because we weren't aware of something. So we try to make sure people are aware, you know, something goes out, you, could, you know, say it hurts and let someone know so we can correct it. We also wanna make sure that individuals are both held for their action. And something else that we tell our, our supervisors and managers, we also hold them accountable for their inactions. If a supervisor uh, or a management employee, including mentors, fail to, re to report harassing behavior, then they are subject to administrative action themselves for failure to follow our policy and report. Overall goal again is National Park Service provides a respectful, safe place, a workplace for everyone. So starting out with a little bit of definitions, understanding about harassing conduct. Um, we have a director's orders called Director's Order 16E. It's our anti-harassment policy. And it defines harassing conduct as unwelcome conduct, verbal or physical, including intimidation, ridicule, insult, comments, or physical conduct is based on an individual's protected status. And further part of that, that's the first part, looking at those kind of things about protected status. We're going to get to that in the next definition, but also talking about when that behavior can reasonably uh, have adverse impacts on the work environment or employment decisions as it relates to an employee. Of course, as interns, you're not National Park Service employees, but hopefully we'll, that you will be able to, you know, one day find a job with the National Park Service or another conservation agency. We wanna make sure that if you have those kinds of concerns or situations, you need to understand that you're protected when you come forward to, to report any allegations of harassing conduct. So let's talk about protected status. And when you look at protected status, this comes right from the Department of um, Legal Opportunity Commission's regulations or codified law about anti-discrimination that are found in Title VII. And protected status is defined as an individual's race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy and gender identity, sexual orientation, national origin, and age. Now for the actual EEOC, the law says 40 years age and over. Um, but at the National Park Service, our policy does not have an age limit. You can be 16 and file a complaint based on discrimination based on age. So we did a study and we found out that a lot of our employees had experienced what they believed to be um, harassment based on their age, not being 40 years or older, because we bring a lot of young folks into the organization through our youth programs uh, offices, through internships and others. So we decided to also include any age and not just limit it to 40 years or older. Disability, family medical history, including genetic information, status as a parent, marital status, or political affiliation. And we will be um, also further defining gender identity based on transgender bi binary um, sexes uh, to, to include that. And EOC is working on writing that law, but our policy kind of generally covers it based on any type of uh, sex-based harassment. And you'll hear terms about sex-based harassment or non-sex-based harassment. The next definition is political protected activity. And protected activity includes reporting complaints, assisting someone else in reporting a complaint as it relates to the uh, process, regardless of the form. Um, in this particular process, um, the EEO process and the anti-harassment process are two separate processes. Um, you can file a harassment complaint um, against an individual and it doesn't stop someone from filing EEO complaints um, through, the, through their agency's process. So what I wanna do real quickly is just show you this quick little video um, from the Equal Opportunity Commission that talks about what is harassment. So you're aware of it if you ever see it. Hello, and welcome to training on workplace harassment. All of us deserve to work in an environment free of harassment. However, the significant number of complaints of harassment filed every year proves that having some 
This is still a problem. In this short presentation, <coughs> I'll explain to you how to recognize unlawful workplace harassment and what you, an employee, should do if you are a victim of harassment. Before I go further, let me clarify something. I will explain protections under the federal EEO laws enforced by the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. These laws apply to all employers with 15 or more employees and all federal employees. However, your state may have anti-discrimination employment laws that include additional protections that also apply to you and others in your state. Let's show you a real-life scenario of harassment in the workplace. And like all the examples you'll see today, it's drawn from actual cases. Hey, man, check it out. Oh, man, look at her. <laughs> right. You know what I would do to her. I'm going to take a picture for later. Yeah, do that. Why don't you me. take a picture? It'll last longer. I already took two. Oh. <laughs> oh, Come man. on, man. So let's start with the definition. Unlawful workplace harassment is unwelcome verbal or physical conduct that is based on one of the protected EEO bases that it alters the conditions of the victim's employment. This unwelcome harassment can change the conditions of employment in two ways. Number one. <laughs> by being so objectively offensive, intimidating, hostile, or abusive that it effectively changes the terms and conditions of the workplace. Or, number two, by culminating in an employment action such as termination or demotion. Here are examples that could be part of workplace harassment. A man touching a woman inappropriately. What do you think you're doing? Relax, this one little piece. Oh, you're disgusting. Come on, sweetheart. I'm just kidding. Anti-Islamic cartoons sent to co-workers by email. <laughs> Racial slurs painted on a wall or victim's car. and derogatory comments made about an employee's physical disability. Hey, look, sorry, you're crippled. <laughs> Please don't call me names. It's demeaning. To help you understand the definition, let's discuss the phrases unwelcome conduct protected EEO bases, and alter the conditions of the victim's employment. Unwelcome conduct is conduct that you did not initiate and you find undesirable or offensive. For example, the reactions of the woman in the break room vignette showed that she was offended by the behavior of the men. Unwelcomeness depends on how it is received. Some employees, however, enjoy engaging in harmless sexual banter, dating, or even exchanging sexual jokes at work. This conduct may not be unwelcome if it is okay with everyone involved. Another example might be two co-workers who like to debate religion while on their breaks. Again, this may not be unwelcome if it's okay with both employees. Nonetheless, your employer is responsible for everyone's work environment. So, even if the two co-workers are having a private conversation and both are fine with the topic, that doesn't mean everyone else is okay with it. If you are offended by the sexual banter or religious discussions you overhear from your co-workers. Their actions could be creating a hostile work environment for you. However, if you decide to join in, you can't later complain about being harassed because your actions indicated that you did not find your co-workers' conduct unwelcome. I also want to discuss how to communicate unwelcomeness. Merely saying something like, 
I don't like that joke, may be enough. You can also communicate unwelcomeness by letting your supervisor know or by going to the person identified in your employer's anti-harassment policy. When most people hear the word harassment, they think of sexual harassment. The men's behavior in the break room vignette might be the beginning of sexual harassment that eventually creates a hostile work environment. Sex is one of the protected EEO bases. So for now, let's just focus on sex harassment. Conduct does not have to be sexual to be based on sex. Sometimes it's about gender. For example, a woman who refers to all of her male employees as cavemen or repeatedly tells them how men are inferior to women may be harassing them, but not in a sexual way. Jokes emailed around the office about women being unable to read a map or unable to properly park cars would be based on gender, but are not sexual in nature. Or when employees bully a coworker and call her names because she is transgender, this may be harassment based on gender, even though it is not sexual. So harassment based on sex includes both harassment that is sexual and harassment that is non-sexual and based on gender. Did you also know that both the victim and the harasser can be either a woman or a man? And the victim and harasser can be the same sex? Yes, men can harass women or men, and women can harass men or women. This goes for both sexual and gender-based harassment. But remember, harassment can be based on any of the protected bases. You should not ridicule, irritate, or mistreat another person because of his or her sex or gender, race, color, religion, national origin, age, 40 or older, genetic information, or disability. So what is considered the workplace? The workplace is essentially wherever you are working, not just the physical space where you work. For example, while on a business trip, a company's attorney makes sexual innuendos about her male assistant, quote, taking care of her needs and refers to him as her boy toy. He is embarrassed and offended by these comments and references. So this could be workplace harassment, even though this is happening outside of their actual work site. Your workplace can extend to anywhere you might travel for work, for a conference or trade fair, or even at a local restaurant where an employee's retirement celebration is held. And absolutely anyone who has access to your workplace can be considered a harasser. This means your supervisor, a supervisor from another area, a co-worker, or even non-employees like the guy who repairs the copier, the woman who delivers the mail, or one of the folks who clean your office windows could be a harasser. We've covered the first part of our definition. What is unwelcome conduct? And we've talked about the protected EEO bases. Now let's talk about the third phase in our definition, alter the conditions of the victim's employment. A hostile work environment is created if there are comments or conduct that is unwelcome and so severe or pervasive that it creates an intimidating or abusive environment for you or others. So what is meant by severe or pervasive? First, let's look at conduct that is severe. Conduct that is severe is so serious or harmful that it may only need to happen once to create a hostile work environment. Physical touching escalates the severity of any given situation. Other examples of severe conduct include highly charged words and symbols in the workplace, like a hangman's noose or swastika painted on the wall, or use of the N-word. In general, the more severe the conduct, the less pervasive it needs to be to create a hostile work environment. So what do we mean by conduct that is pervasive? Pervasive means the conduct occurs on a regular basis. That's why some harassment, such as jokes, may not be initially considered severe, but when it occurs over and over again, it can become more than just inappropriate. It can be considered pervasive. The conduct by the man in the break room vignette occurred once. However, if the men in the opening vignette often made sexually suggestive gestures towards their coworker when they saw her or passed her in the hallway, then the frequency of their conduct could create a hostile work environment for her. Occasional teasing, offhand comments, or isolated incidents that are not serious may not be considered unlawful harassment. 
But the more often this type of behavior occurs, the less severe it needs to be to create a hostile work environment. Harassment can come in different forms. You've probably heard of the term hostile work environment, but have you heard of the term tangible employment action? Anyone with access to your workplace can create a hostile work environment a supervisor, a co-worker, or a non-employee. But only a supervisor or someone with supervisory authority can make significant changes in the conditions of your employment. In other words, when unwelcome conduct results in a tangible employment action, such as denial of overtime, discipline, promotion, or termination, the harasser can only be someone with this kind of authority. For example, if your supervisor is pressuring you for dates or for sex and you keep saying no, he may be creating a hostile work environment for you. If your supervisor then punishes you for saying no by taking away your office space or denying you training, then he has taken a tangible employment action against you. And remember, it doesn't matter whether your supervisor is a man or a woman. Either way, no employee should have to put up with harassment or be punished for speaking up about it. So what are your responsibilities as an employee when it comes to unlawful workplace harassment? First, do you know if your employer has an anti-harassment policy? Most employers do. Find yours and read it. Secondly, you should avoid engaging in inappropriate behavior. What is inappropriate behavior? To start with, offensive conduct that is based on race, sex, color, religion, national origin, age, or disability is inappropriate. So, for example, when you start to make a joke about someone's age or forward one of those emails that talks about a woman in a derogatory manner, stop yourself. Next, if you believe you are a victim of harassment or witness harassment and have supervisory responsibility, take a look at your employer's policy and follow it. Typically, your first step to getting help is to alert an appropriate official. If you don't have any idea where to start or you're just not sure or have questions, talk to someone in your HR or EEO office. Once alerted, it is then your employer's responsibility to take steps to investigate and stop harassment. Finally, commit to attending and participating in all training sessions provided by your employer regarding workplace harassment. It is your responsibility to stay informed. In this presentation, we've covered a massive amount of information in a short time. We defined unlawful employment harassment, talked about the basis covered by the EEO laws and how the workplace extends to wherever you are working, and discussed how harassment can affect the work environment or affect the conditions of employment for its victims. If you still have questions, we have lots of information about harassment on our website at www.eeoc.gov. That's eeoc.gov. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about workplace harassment, as working in an environment free of harassment is the right of every employee. All right, so that did provide a lot of the basic information that you need to know about anti-harassment, about harassment, and how to, how to report it we're going to get to in a couple of minutes. But some other things you need to know, that as we talked about before, NPS will not tolerate uh, harassing conduct, whether it's sexual or non-sexual. Um, it, it's important to understand that the, that this particular process of reporting harassment internally without going uh, to, uh, to to court is, is to, it allows the agency or the, any employer to stop harassment before it really gets surveys, uh, pervasive or severe. Um, talk a little bit about that. The next thing we talked about is we talk about NPS expected behaviors, expect everyone to treat everyone with dignity, respect, and kindness. Uh, listen to other views before expressing your view. Don't belittle, don't judge or patronize others. Refrain from demeaning uh, discriminatory or harassing behavior and speech. Honor the roles and responsibility of all and their contributions to be made. Think before you act and speak. And this is really important when we talk about through the virtual network of, of being able to work through platforms such as Zoom and, and, and the like. Be mindful of what you're wearing. Be mindful that what that t-shirt might say or the backgrounds or even the screensavers that you have on your computer or the backgrounds that you have in Zoom, whether or not it's offensive or could be offensive. Focus on the work that you're put, 
how you're supposed to perform. Take personal responsibility for your personal conduct and behavior. Respect the rules and workplaces of the federal workplace as well as the National Park Service. And then um, just again, talking about some examples of unacceptable conduct, you know, we talk about the physical, verbal, or nonverbal conduct. The verbal practices are jokes. Some people might say well, it's just a joke. Um, but what we say is if, if one person is offended by it, it's inappropriate. So just be mindful of the types of jokes you, that we might take or the subjects that you're talking about. Any types of physical con conduct, such as touching and hugging, that's unwanted. You might have a personal relationship with someone and not offended by it. Um, but this is inappropriate, unwanted, or unwelcome um, touching. Um, staring at someone making sexual gestures, referring to people using inappropriate expressions such as sexy, hottie, sweet, sweetie, whatever ones are out there now being used. Of course, risque or obscene comments or, or, or either verbal or in written or, or sent through as, a, as a form of a email communication or um, texting either. Uh, displaying sexual images either in print or digitally or making homophobic insults and threats. We talked about management duties to act. Again, our managers and supervisors have a responsibility who observe or informed harassing conduct. They must report that behavior and they have a time frame that they must do it. Um, the idea is that you, you'll be protected for confidentiality if you, if you, if you talk about that. Um, if you report it, then we'll keep the, the, make it anonymous or keep it as confidential as, as the law will allow us. There are certain circumstances where the law requires us to, to provide additional information. Um, talking a little bit more about the confidentiality, kind of go through the particular process. So as interns, uh, if an incident occurs, one of the first decision trees is, is the in incident harassment. If not, you'll go ahead and go through the your partner organization's reporting processes. Um, if it is, harassment, the next question is, are National Park Service employees involved? And if there are no National Park Service employees involved in either way, then it will still go through the partners process. But if National Park Service employees are involved, then we need to report that process through our National Park Service uh, reporting process, which is our anti-harassment tracking system. You can report to your partner organization. We ask them to report to us, or you can report to your National Park Service site supervisor. They're required to start taking action and input that information within a set time frame, so we can conduct our own personal investigation. Uh, we have investigators on site um, in many places in our regional offices. We also have two senior investigators that split the United States in half. And then we have a host of other contract investigators that we can utilize to, to do an inquiry or, um, or, or a, a thorough investigation if necessary. This is the outline for our internal process. Um, once a person uh, reports harassing conduct, one of the first things we looked at is whether there's a safety or security risk that needs to protect the employee. If so, we contact local law enforcement. If there's a crime that's being committed, criminal matters take precedence over administrative matters. So if someone has been raped or attempted rape, the first thing we want someone to do is dial 911 and uh, get local law enforcement involved and we'll take it from there. Um, then it's the intake process, preliminary decisions are made, whether we need to separate people from each other or change shifts or get different supervisors, do the investigation, the action determination, um, whether or not there was harassment, we have a process that we go through to, to make that determination. So kind of breaking down the process, the intake, um, it goes to a management official or someone uh, that's an employee relations specialist, someone that, that handles uh, harassment. Um, it's entered into our tracking system. We use this tracking system so that we can look at the types of trends that we're seeing to also modify our training or identify particular employees or particular work sites that might need additional attention. Part of the investigator, um, we use a wide variety of investigators. Right now, there's no time limit for how long I think it's an investigation to be completed, but shortly, uh, probably in the next quarter, is going to be a 75-day limit on outstanding investigations. Based on the outcome of the investigation, uh, the agency might take a, a disciplinary or adverse action against an involved employee. Um, and a lot of times, people are concerned. They don't want anything to happen to anyone. 
um, or lose their jobs. We have a wide variety of corrective actions that's taken and the corrective actions are taken based on the severity and pervasiveness of the actual incident. Um, and also based on the person's um, position within the organization, the type of job that they have. So we're required to take that action. And again, we talk about management's duty to, to act. So we have to take an action. Otherwise we, the agency could continue to be liable uh, from time to time, you'll come across folks that have definitely unconscious biases. We all have our own unconscious biases. We make assumptions and judgments about people's and situations. And we just ask everyone to treat people the same, no matter their race, religion, gender, size, age, how they dress, talk, the country of origin, or how their name is pronounced or stated. Um, some people might have a tendency to disc discriminate against a group or type of people unintentionally. And we can't keep in mind, it doesn't matter whether or not it was intentional or not, whether it's just it's, discrimination is bad, harassment is bad. Um, it also get, comes out of negative stereotypes that influences people's behavior. Sometimes people might say, I didn't realize um, that I offended you. It doesn't matter what their intention was. If you're offended, you're offended. If, if it hurts, you say, ouch, you report it, we take action. Um, to, to just also to educate individuals about what things are appropriate and not appropriate. Again, harassment has no place. Uh, we are definitely committed to providing a safe and respectful work environment for all our employees, volunteers, interns, and as well as the general public. Um, and you might find that you might come in contact with members of the general public who might make comments to you, uh, microaggressions or stereotypes, or even harassing you. We want you to let the National Park Service supervisors as well as your partner organization aware of those so that we can step up and protect you uh, if those things to, to take occur. Uh, we can also bring in our law enforcement arm to address those particular issues, especially in remote areas of, of park sites um, or even in the urban area. So we just want you to be safe. That's the important part. We talked about that, just kind of an overview again. Um, in the National Park Service, again, we don't address 40 years or older as any age. So the National Park Service definition of anti-harassment is more, more inclusive than um, the EEOCs. Um, again, we don't even put an age on it. So at any particular age, we talked about the terms protected class. Sometimes you hear protected class or protected status. And that just refers to the groups protected from employment discrimination under Title VI, under Title VI and Title VII of the um, anti-discrimination laws under Title VII of EEOCs regulations. Protected activity also includes waste fraud, fraud or abuse or whistleblower proceedings. Uh, there's just a recent uh, determination that EEO doesn't um, qualify as, as a, a protected activity under whistleblowers, but you can, it is still a protected activity under the EEO regulations. Talking about retaliation, again, it's unlawful for anyone um, who's engaged in protective activity by raising a claim of harassment, reporting an allegation of harassing conduct or discrimination, or even participating um, by providing evidence or testifying um, or intervening to protect others who have suffered harassing conduct or discrimination. So there's types of um, rules. One of those is op opposition rule. The opposition clause talks about if you step up for somebody else, um, for instance, you see one of your other interns being um, harassed or discriminated against and you uh, speak up on their behalf, you're covered for, from retaliation because you're acting for, uh, you know, for someone else. Participation, you're still participating in that particular process is when you report it, just like if it happened to you and you reported it, the participation clause would also kick into play for you. Um, we always remind folks about being aware of what they communicate through emails or through private chats, um, as well as through Zoom and other types of platforms. Um, not too long ago, two African-American employees of Morgan Stanley employees filed a $60 million racial discrimination lawsuit based on racial jokes that they received through email. Um, the class was settled. The case was settled for an undisclosed sum, but it was pretty high. So remember also that emails are for official business and our problem is a permanent record. They're never deleted from the server. So even if you hit delete, they still exist within that particular process. 
under the, our 16-year harassment process, there is no time limit for filing a, a harassment complaint. So even if you were here last year and you experienced something, you still can come forward this year and report that. We'll still look at it and investigate it and go through the particular processes. You're going to come across disagreements from time to time, and disagreements are normal. Um, we just ask you to keep in mind when you talk about disagreements, always watch your tone, keep your voice steady, never raise or yell your voice to act unprofessional. Um, when you're communicating things to avoid um, saying things like you people or things that can be construed as being racial, we focus on I statements. I feel this way when this was said or when you said this. Um, and know when to take a break and agree to disagree and move on and get someone else involved to help you with the, to that particular um, conflict. So if you experience harassment, you know, we encourage you to tell the person that their conduct is unwelcome or unwanted um, and request that it stop. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, talk to the supervisor, the person that's harassing you, any National Park Service supervisor or management official, any of our employee relations specialists working in our HR officers, offices, someone from the National Park Service Youth Program Office, um, the National Park Service sponsor that sponsored you, or even through my office and my contact information is available at the end of the program. So again, when allegations are received, we take very care about each every allegation. Every time there's an allegation filed within our system, I receive it, I review it, I track it, make sure it follows up. Uh, immediate evaluation is important to make sure that there's no safety or, or, or security issues to determine whether there's a crime has been committed. You know, again, if there's stalking, sexual abuse, sexual assault, rape, or attempted rape, um, or any of those types of things, we want you to contact local law enforcement first. We also coordinate with our local agency attorneys to make sure that each case meets the criteria for harassment. And even if it doesn't meet the criteria for harassment, it's referred to our local employee relations office that works with our general counsel. Then we still be taking um, an adverse action or a corrective action for those things that don't rise to the level of harassment, but just, just inappropriate conduct or inappropriate behavior, such as someone fighting or someone being rude um, or disrespectful to you. So we still have those particular processes, but we need you to report them. So even if they don't go to the harassment tracking process, it does get taken care of by a, a set of folks within our employee relations office that deals with our general counsel. More about confidentiality. Again, we'll keep it to the greatest extent possible by, by required by law. Uh, the identity of the person being um, alleging the violations of this policy will be kept confidential except necessary to conduct the appropriate investigation. Uh, we might need to provide your information to one of our investigators um, if it becomes a complex case. So your information will be out there. They'll come contact you to talk about it. Only those people that have a right and a need to know will understand um, who was involved or as otherwise required by law. So for example, if someone made a threat to do bodily harm to someone, then we have to make sure that we go through a particular process or if there's involving minors. Some quick reviews and takeaways. Um, civil treatment is required at all times. Always treat people with dignity and respect. Be mindful of any conscious biases that you may have and adjust appropriately. Learn how to disagree respectfully. Never yell or raise your voice through doing disagreements. Always take responsibilities for your own behavior. Report in inappropriate harassment. Um, step up, stand up to help us uh, stop harassment. Um, if it was happening to you, you would want someone to step up with you. So if someone asks you for witness statement or information and you actually have information to provide, please do so. It can make a big difference in, in uh, how the outcome of that case may come out. And again, we want you to make sure you know how to report inappropriate and harassing conduct. And at this time, I guess I'll just open it up for questions. Anyone have any questions? I want to make sure we have time and see we have about a little bit more than 15 minutes. If you have any questions, I can answer. And you can type your questions in the chat. Um, you can send it to everyone, or you can also select a feature that allows you just to send it to uh, myself or Danielle.
Yes, please let us know any questions that you have. This is the time to ask. Uh, if you're confused about the <laughs> process or how to report, who to report to, anything like that, we can answer those right now. I see that. Um, I think one of the things also from the National Park Service is that we have um, a lot of different scenarios. We have a lot of different places where employees work. Um, and if you came across someone within the hate group, um, please let our supervisors handle it. Our local law enforcement folks deal with it. Um, you will find that you know groups such as the Hells Angels visit, visit national parks on a regular basis. Um, usually, we don't have any problems out of organizations such as the Hells Angels or other motorcycle groups, whether they're part of the one percenters or they're just a social club. But there will be places sometimes in 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 our work environment where people don't like what's going on with the National Park Service or the fact that. Um, the National Park Service is engaged in certain activities. And sometimes it's, it's not even based on any race, um, national origin, color, or anything like that. It's sometimes people were just biased about the fact that you're not a local. Um, you might come across that as well. So it's really want to make sure that you, you know, that you can always go to your supervisor, the Park Service staff, if you experience something from a visitor or for some, someone else uh, in, in or around where you're working. Um, I have a question. Um, this was because happened to me in my previous federal job, and I just want from your perspective on how to approach it. Like if a um, if a part if a, an employee is saying like inappropriate comments that make you uncomfortable, especially because like you know I'm a young professional, I'm just starting off and stuff like that, and that other person is maybe older. How how would you say it? that you're uncomfortable? Because I think that was like the hardest thing for me was figuring out how do I even say that? That's, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. And that's why we don't have an age limit on it because we recognize the differences in the workforces. There are five generations in the workforce right now. One of the simple things you can just say is that I don't feel comfortable with, with the way you're talking. Um, and you can let them know. And if they you know, ask, sometimes people are not aware that they're offending folks. I'll use my mother as an example. My mother's a very sweet, loving woman of 82 years old. She was born uh, in the 40s. Sometimes the way she comes out of her mouth, just about food. She says, I don't want to eat that Mexican food. I don't want to eat that stuff. I don't want to eat. I'm like, what are, wait, Tom, time out, mom. You know what I do for a living. You know that I, I do investigations. You know I do this. And I tell her, I says, I understand this is the way you're talking, but let's talk about the food. So you eat beans, you eat rice, you eat, I don't just name a bunch of different foods. I said, do you eat those things? And I said, so you think you're the only one that eats these kinds of foods? And we'll have a conversation and she'll start laughing because she was like, well, I didn't mean it that way. But it's, it's never about what you, someone meant. It's never their intent. It's, it's, even if they were joking, it's not appropriate. Um, and people shouldn't be telling you that you're just too sensitive um, or that you are woke. You know, I, I'm not uncomfortable with your world wokeness because everything now is just anything I say is just going to be held and used against me. People need to learn how things have changed in today's society. Um, there's an executive order that talks about um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, when you look at the kinds of things that people have done for a long period of time, we, you know, when, when I was growing up, people made fun of folks for fun. It was just a thing that they did. They would call you out. They would join on you. They would tell you your shoes didn't look good or you were too big or you were too small or your skin color was just too dark or it was you know, too light. Um, that kind of continues. And you're going to have a lot of issues with folks in the workplaces because the way people process and look at information is totally different. Um, and for those people who are just generally being honest and saying that I didn't mean to offend you, it's an education component that goes to it too, because once you place them on notice that that's inappropriate and they continue about it, then they've, they've crossed the line. So I hope that answers your question. If not, I can further clarify. Um, no, thank, thank you for, for that, for sure. Great, it's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Any other questions? 
Hi, Ken. Hi. This is Ernestine. Hi. Thank you so much for your time today. I was just curious if you could share what is the most common um, complaint that we receive from our interns during their experience uh, with us? Uh, it seems like it's, it's mostly about comments, uh, microaggressions, uh, people teasing. Um, and that's why it's important that you stop it when it happens. And we've been doing a lot more making sure that our parks that receive interns receive some training and information as well. Uh, we're getting ready to roll out a different, um, a new training cadre of information um, that we're working on right now. And we're, we're trying to work more so that people understand that so that about over 50% of the harassing conducts received within the whole National Park Service involves a negative or rude comment. So that means we have a lot to do as it relates to how we communicate with folks. And that's something that we're really trying to press on to pick people clearly understand. Yes, Marshall. Hello, um, yes, thank you. Um, something I kind of just wanted to say for some of the interns, um, I was an intern last year and um, I know it's, I guess for the interns, it can be kind of scary um, just thinking about, you know, what potential that might happen and coming forward. But, you know, I remember at my park uh, last year, there was some issues with like, um, um, visitors uh, mostly like who would say different things regarding like you know race ethnicity appearance um, and there's even an instance with like some volunteers and like ageism but a big thing was just being honest and being able to communicate with your supervisor um, I talked to my supervisors when those incidents happened they were taken care of right away they were showing how they were supportive of me and I even had some instances where there were volunteer, or, um, not volunteers I apologize uh, visitors who would come and they would say things to me and my supervisor would come out right away, correct them, and they would stand up for me. So it's one of those big things I do want to say. Just just always feel free, feel safe to go to your supervisors because they are here to like be there for you. And if there are ever instances with your supervisors, go to the supervisors from LHIP or uh, EFTA because at the end of the day, everyone wants to make sure that you can have an amazing, safe internship. And that's one of the big reasons I wanted to come back this year is because they did that for me last summer. And it really is a great organization. So just be open and feel safe because that's what's most important. Great. The next question. There's one in the chat that says, can you define what a microaggression is? Certainly, certainly. Thank you for, for, for bringing it back to home. So microaggressions occur that these kind of snot comments it don't come across as a joke. For example, people might say, like, to me, I hear it a lot of times, uh, people will talk to me on the phone, but they're assuming the person who says, well, you speak very well for a black guy. I'm like, what do you mean I speak well for a black guy? Really? Or I, I'll do something. For example, I love every genre of music. And sometimes I might be listening to classical music. I might be listening to country music. And someone says, I didn't know black folks listen to country music. I'm like, are you kidding me? Really? So microaggressions are these tiny things, kind of like a mosquito bite. You know, by themselves, they don't add up to much other than some annoyances. But if you kept hearing them all the time, you know, it's based on your ethnicity. It's based on, you know, oh, let me touch your hair. I've never seen hair like that. Um, or you dress well. Or asking someone, where are you from? And they tell you, like, no, where are you really from? And you tell them, like, no, like, where were you born? I was born in the United States. Well, you can't be. You speak English so well. So microaggressions are just... Uh, it kind of goes with stereotypes, stereotypical kinds of things. It also based on, on people's biases. There are unconscious biases. Some people have unconscious biases. They just don't know what to say or how to say it. You know, they automatically assume because of the way someone is dressed. Um, for example, a lot of times I, I mostly wear suits. I, I mostly wear suits all the time. And when I go into places with a suit on, I can be treated one way. I can come back to that same location, wear a pair of jeans and a, a t-shirt with a ball cap and no one will serve me. Um, it's based on those stereotypes or the way they come across to, to talk to me. Uh, it's just inappropriate. So it becomes that kind of thing that reminds you of, of these stereotypes that you hear all, all along. Um, and microaggressions kind of go right along with those comments that you'll hear from park visitors, or you might hear from old elderly staff members, or you might hear from young staff members. Um, 
it's just about where they came from. It's about their there's a misunderstanding of things, and until you correct them, they don't. So a lot of times they don't realize that we, you know we talk about microaggressions. It's usually putting down a minority or someone that's um, an at risk or community or disadvantaged folks as well. So I hope that answers your question about microaggressions. And there are a lot of great videos out there. In fact, MTV did one. You can sh uh, search for MTV microaggressions. It's a great video. Um, and it's just hilarious when you look at it. In fact, um, Saturday, Night, Saturday Night Live had also done some things about microaggressions, talking about it as well. So you can get more information. So I hope that helps. Great questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brody. This is Shelda Diaz. I'm with Environment for the Americas. I'm the program manager for Mosaics, but also Jessica Johnson is also here. She's the program manager for ESA. And I just wanted to ask and maybe clarify a little bit. So when an intern comes to us, the partner, as an intern from our program, um, if you said that if the harassment is coming from an NPS employer and they come to us, there is time there's a time sensitivity in the matter that yeah. we have to report it it's not confidential that they came to us right. and reported harassment or a microaggression pattern uh, how many hours or days do we have as well, the partner we just to... ask you as soon as you become aware of it that you let one of our folks know the timeline starts with our employees entered into the system so it's from the time that they actually find a way that there's been an issue not on your end but as soon oh. as possible we just encourage you, you know, if it happens you know, at five o'clock and there's no one available, you know, the next day, um, or even send okay. an email about it just because we don't want that to continue to linger. So, you know, and, and one of the things we have timelines for is because of the weekends, we have weekend work and we have, you know, night work. In some parks, we have work around the clock in law enforcement and maintenance that if something takes place, we want to stop it right away. We don't want you to have okay. to wait for three or four days. If it happens at nine o'clock and you find out about it, you know, we want you to tell us as soon as possible so that we can fix it and stop that harassment by going to that individual and saying, stop, stop. What you're doing is not appropriate. And then letting the mm -hmm. investigative process go on to see whether it rose to that level of being severe and pervasive. Good question. Thank you for asking for clarifying information. Thank you. All good questions. Any other ones? I think another area that's um, important to discuss, we talked about those gender-based um, harassment. You know, in the video, they talked about, you know, women talking about all men or, you know, or cavemen. Um, and that does happen. We do have those instances, both where women are filing complaints, but it's also for men as well. Um, one of the common ones that we've seen is, you know, this is not a woman's job. Step, step aside, little lady, let me, before you get yourself hurt. Uh, it's about educating individuals about their, their conversation. And they might have well-meaning intent never to hurt anyone, um, but the words can also hurt you very badly. Um, when I was growing up, people would say sticks and stones may break your bones, but words um, can never hurt you. Well, it's like, really not true. Words cut you to the bone. You, you remember those words that people have said. You remember those situations just as if uh, you had some type of trauma that eventually goes away. So definitely look at you know, the conversations, the root the rude comments, the jokes. Any other questions? Well, I really wanna thank you for allowing me to come and talk to you about um, harassment, anti-harassment and the processes for addressing it. Um, this is my contact information. That's my work cell phone number. That's the best uh, way of getting a hold of me unless you, you use you know, email. Um, I do respond. I get a lot of calls, a lot, a lot of emails, but harassment is something that I jump on right away. So if you have any concerns, need some clarification about what we talked about today, or you just have some general questions uh, through the course of your time this summer, um, please feel free to reach out to me as well. And I will be keeping in contact with everyone else, uh, especially on the both um, 
our partners and as well as with our youth program office to make sure that we don't have any problems. And if you have any problems, we'll try to rectify it. Now we won't try, we will rectify it and fix it um, so you can have a good time. So thank you for your time.